Uh, so now we're actually going to shift again in terms of the work that we're going to hear about. So we are going to um, now talk about our investigator awards program and I'd like to introduce uh, Kate Winsack. Uh, so uh, Kate's a public health advisor at the NIH Office of Disease Prevention. She's the coordinator of the Pathways to Prevention Workshop Program. So in that, um, in that role, she develops and hosts workshops to identify research gaps in various scientific areas. Um, she's also responsible for promoting and facilitating many of the collaborative prevention um, research projects across the agency. Kate's a member of the SGM Research Coordinating Committee and has served as co-chair of the Investigator Awards Subcommittee since its inception. And I'd just like to say personally, um, I've known Kate for nearly two decades, and that's scary to say. Uh, we both started our careers um, as fellows um, here at NIH, and it has been a real joy to watch how much Kate is committed to um, diversity efforts and understanding um, issues related to underserved populations. So um, thank you, Kate, for being here and for introducing the program and our first award. So thank you again for the introduction. I'm so happy to introduce our Investigator Awards Program recipients for 2020. Um, this is the NIH Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office's third annual Research Investigator Awards Program. And what better way to highlight uh, these researchers than to do so as part of this research symposium. So I'm really glad to be able to do this today. Um, as Karen said, I'm Kate Winsick. I serve as the chair of the Investigator Awards uh, Subcommittee of the SGMRO's Coordinating Committee. And I'm a public health advisor in the Office of Disease Prevention at NIH. Um, the NIH SGM Investigator Awards Program is an annual event. It was developed to recognize early stage investigators who have made substantial outstanding research contributions in areas related to SGM health and who are poised to become future leaders or are already leading the field of SGM health research. This year, we are making two early stage investigator awards to outstanding researchers who have demonstrated achievements that place them on a trajectory to become leaders in their field. Um, and additionally, for the second year in a row, we've identified a distinguished investigator to recognize a leader in the field of SGM health research who performs independent research in an academic industry or government setting with independent research funding. The awardee must demonstrate a high level of productivity, a distinguished record of original contributions as a recognized leader in the field, and serve as a mentor and role model in sexual and gender minority health research. Uh, so a review committee representing six institutes and centers at NIH and representatives from the Office of the Director reviewed and scored the applications received. And we were just awed by the level of achievement of all three awardees. And on behalf of the committee, I'd like to commend them for their award. We really are very excited. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow committee members who reviewed the proposals and also really thought carefully about our goals and our criteria for the award. They include Vanessa White, Michael Hahn, Suzanne Allison, Melissa Gerald, Kelly Chandler, and Ryan Mahon. And I hope I did not forget anyone. So our first early stage investigator to present is Dr. Billy Kacheris. And Billy, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your first year last name. Uh, Dr. Kacheris is an assistant professor for the program for the study of LGBT health at Columbia University School of Nursing. And his lecture today will highlight advancing cardiovascular science in SGM populations. Thank you, Billy, for joining us. Thank you. Hi. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to the awards committee for selecting me for this award. And I'm really honored to receive this award, but even more so um, receiving it this year with other investigators whose work I respect. I Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work um, focused on advancing cardiovascular science and SGM populations, and specifically my work around sexual minority women's cardiovascular health, which is the focus of my NHLBI Career Development Award. Next slide. So I think it's important. I 
have had to think a lot about well, how did I end up where I am now and doing the work that I do now. And really, I didn't, I am a nurse researcher, but I started out actually with a degree in political science and studying inequities related to power and political participation. And during that time that I was completing my first baccalaureate degree, I worked at the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing and was really exposed to not only nursing, but nursing research and sort of fell in love with the profession and decided soon after that I was going to pursue a career in nursing research. Next. I then went to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and worked as a summer intern on a program that was trying to increase diversity of the healthcare workforce. So I learned a lot about the disparities that exist in America and how many of these disparities are related to not only socio social determinants, but also issues within the workforce and lack of diversity. So by the time I started my baccalaureate degree in nursing, I had a good understanding sort of a policy, relevant policy and research issues. And it wasn't until I started working as a nurse in cardiothoracic surgery and vascular surgery at NYU Langone Health that I realized two things. One was that most of the negative health outcomes that we saw among our surgical patients really had more to do with at the time, I used to call things that happened in the home or outside of the hospital, but really it was social determinants. I just didn't have the language to describe that. And the other thing I realized was in caring for LGBTQ patients, just how little LGBTQ health um, education I received during my clinical education. And just the disparities that I noticed just anecdotally caring for the patients. I noticed that LGBTQ patients I cared for had higher comorbidities, more likely to um, have uh, tobacco use disorders and a number of other substance use, uh, another substance use disorders. And that really inspired me to start thinking about developing an area of research or program of research on SGM health. Next slide. But it wasn't until I started my PhD program in 2013 that I read the Institute of Medicine report on SGM health, and I identified, or the report identified, clear knowledge gaps around cardiovascular disease. And that sort of put me down this path of really wanting to understand factors that contribute to those differences that have been described. So we know that SGM adults have a higher prevalence of a number of cardiovascular risk factors. I mean, the trick is that actually these are risk factors for a number of chronic conditions, including cancer and dementia. But we see higher rates of a number of these factors compared to cisgender and heterosexual peers. And we know that these, some of these factors differ across different SGM groups, but overall, there's clear evidence that they are higher. Next slide. So the first, one of the first papers that I did in my PhD program was a systematic review of cardiovascular disease and sexual minorities. And we published two papers on that. Next slide. But the important thing I think about that systematic review and why I tell early stage investigators or PhD and postdoc fellows that I work with is to really understand the literature to identify gaps on a topic. This systematic review really set the course for the research agenda that I continued in my postdoctoral fellowship and then even now today. So we found in the systematic review that factors contributing to the cardiovascular disparities that were being described were really poorly understood, which limits our ability to design interventions for this group. And also, despite the fact that the minority stress model is the prevailing explanation for these disparities, very few studies were examining minority stress and cardiovascular health. And I mean, few studies were even looking at just general stress. And then lastly, um, I think of the studies that we examined, which was 31, only seven studies included any biological data for outcomes like hypertension or diabetes. So there was an over-reliance in the field on self-reported data. Next slide. And based on this, my dissertation research focused was a secondary analysis of NHANES data in which we examined both um, self-reported and objective measures of cardiovascular risk among sexual minorities. And what we found was that lesbian and bisexual women had higher odds of current smoking and objectively measured obesity and hyperglycemia compared to heterosexual women. And among bisexual men, we also saw object higher odds of objectively measured obesity, hypertension, and hyperglycemia compared to heterosexual men. Next slide. 
And what this, these two sort of papers or projects really did was solidify my area of research focused on biobehavioral approaches to identify and intervene on social factors that influence the cardiovascular health of SGM populations. And I am trained as a gerontological nurse practitioner, so I always think of everything as across the life course and how things that happen earlier in life impact late life. So in particular, I fo have focused mostly on sexual minority women, a group that has clear gaps in our knowledge about their health overall, but particularly around chronic disease. And also as of late in my postdoctoral fellowship, focusing on racial and ethnic minorities. Next slide. So when I went to Columbia, I started as a postdoctoral fellow on an NINR funded T32 focused on comparative effectiveness. And I worked also as a fellow in the program for the study of LGBT health, which is a joint venture between nursing and the, the School of Nursing and the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia. And I did additional research examining the influence of minority stressors with under mentorship with um, doctors Walter Bakhti and Tonda Hughes. And then I also had the opportunity to sort of not only expand my own network, but also expand the network of colleagues of the program for the study of LGBT health by collaborating with cardiovascular researchers at our Center for Behavioral Cardiovascular Health. And we've worked on a number of projects and papers and submitted several grants um, related to the health of sexual and gender minority adults. Next slide. So one of the things that I knew I wanted to do in my postdoctoral fellowship was examine the influence of chronic stressors, so like trauma and discrimination on cardiovascular disease among sexual minority women. And this was one of the first studies that helped um, support my K application that I'd submitted my second year of my postdoctoral fellowship. Next slide. So we were interested in this study to examine the associations of different forms of interpersonal trauma across the lifespan with self-reported CVD risk among sexual minority women. Next slide. We used data from the Chicago Health and Life Experiences of Women study, which is a 20-year longitudinal study of sexual, minorities alcohol, sexual minority women's alcohol use, health, and well-being that has been funded by uh, the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse since the year 2000. And my primary mentor, Tonda Hughes, is, leads that study. There have been five waves since the year 2000. Um, wave five was currently underway. At the time we did this analysis, wave three was the most recently completed wave. So this study reflects data from wave three. Next slide. We examined a number of different traumatic experiences across childhood and adulthood, created indices to uh, by summing up the experiences that people reported. So zero basically created an index of zero to three for childhood and zero to three experiences for adulthood. And then for lifetime trauma, we simply summed the experiences from childhood and adulthood to create a lifetime trauma index. Next slide. In addition to demographic characteristics, we adjusted for a number of psychosocial factors, including depression, PTSD, and social support. Next slide. We also adjusted for some behavioral factors like current smoking, binge drinking, and overeating. Next slide. We looked at three cardiometabolic risk factors. They were all based on self-reported data. So we classified participants as uh, whether or not they were obese based on their self-reported height and weight. And we examined hypertension and diabetes based on self-report of diagnosis by a healthcare provider. Next slide. The interesting thing about the Chalu study is that it's pretty racially and ethnically diverse. So over 60% of the women in the study are either Black, Latina, or other race. And that really is helpful in terms of the amount, of the number of studies that we can do that are actually examining these racial and ethnic differences. So we've, um, we either, I think we have two papers under review now that are looking at racial ethnic differences and a number of health outcomes. But then we also published a paper looking at racial ethnic differences in cardiometabolic risk. Next slide. So for childhood trauma, we found that about 80% um, of the women in the sample reported at least one form of childhood trauma. Next slide. About 60% of women reported some form of, of adulthood trauma. Next. And overall, and although this seems high, 88% of women reported at least one form of trauma across their lifespan. But if you look at general trends in the, in the general population for trauma, this actually falls within that range. Next. And lastly, for 
cardiometabolic risk factors, again, based on self-report, we found that about 38% of the women met criteria for obesity, 17% of them had a diagnosis of hypertension, and 8% had a diagnosis of diabetes. Next. When we examined logistic regression models, we found that childhood trauma was associated with higher odds of diabetes, and adulthood and lifetime trauma were both associated with higher odds of being obese and higher odds of having hypertension. Next slide. So this study has some limitations. First, we it's cross it's even though it's a longitudinal study that we're drawing these analysis or the sample from, we use cross-sectional data from wave three because that was the wave in which a supplementary sample of diverse women was added to Chalu. So we only had one time point of data for about half of the sample. There is also residual confounding. We couldn't measure some important cardiovascular risk factors like diet and physical activity. Our measure of interpersonal trauma didn't account for severity and duration of trauma exposure. And lastly, this was based on self-reported CVD risk. Next slide. But it has clear implications. We found, essentially we found that interpersonal trauma was indeed associated with cardiometabolic risk in sexual minority women. And this has implications for not only screening, but also early prevention for women that have experienced some form of trauma to sort to decrease the negative health effects that traumatic experiences might have, particularly in this population. And this paper I'm really proud of actually won a Best Abstract Award from the American Heart Association, which I was pleasantly surprised about. But I think it's important because other, I think what's starting to happen now is that people across fields are really recognizing the value of the work that SGM researchers are doing. Next slide. So the next study that we did, I wanted to compare these associations of life experiences and cardiovascular health comparing heterosexual and sexual minority women. Next slide. So the purpose of this study was to examine sexual identity differences in cardiovascular health among women and the contribution of adverse life experiences to cardiovascular health. Next slide. We used data from the ESTER study, which was an NHLBI-funded study uh, that occurred in the early 2000s, in which they recruited using convenience sampling, they recruited cisgender, sexual minority, and heterosexual women living in the Pittsburgh area, whose age was 35 or older, and who had no history of CVD. Next slide. We assessed adverse life experiences, including past year discrimination, and um, report of lifetime sexual abuse. So we looked at three different forms of sexual abuse in childhood and adulthood, and created a cumulative index to account for that. Next slide. In addition to psychosocial factors, we also adjusted for demographic characteristics. The psychosocial factors we looked at were depressive symptoms, perceived stress, and social support. Next slide. And we used the American Heart Association's Life Simple 7 measure to assess cardiovascular health. And this measure has been around for about 12 years. And what other studies have found is that this index is predicts incident cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality in the general population. It's been found in multiple studies. And what essentially it is, is seven different health factors that contribute to cardiovascular disease risk. In this study, we didn't include diet because we didn't have adequate data to actually assess diet. But we have the other six risk factors here. And essentially what happens is that for each risk factor, we assign a score of zero for people that meet criteria for poor, um, poor health for that specific metric, one for those that are in the intermediate category, and two for those that are in the ideal category. So when we actually sum those scores, we get a cumulative score between zero and 12, where higher scores reflect better cardiovascular health. Next slide. And what we see in the sample is that as opposed to the Chalu sample, over 90% of the women in the sample were white women. And, but what we did see was that sexual minority women were more likely to have higher educational attainment, report more experiences of discrimination in the past year, and they were significantly more likely to report having at least one form, experiencing at least one form of sexual abuse in their lifetime. Next slide. For the cardiovascular health metrics that we looked at, I'm not showing results for blood pressure, physical activity, and total cholesterol. Those were not significant. But what we see here is that sexual minority women were more likely to be in the poor category for tobacco use, body mass index, and fasting glucose. And just to give you an idea of what these categories mean, for tobacco use, poor category means that you're a current smoker. People that 
were former smokers but quit over a year ago are considered intermediate. And then those who were former smokers but haven't smoked in the last year and people who never smoked receive a score in the ideal range for tobacco use. In the last row here, you can see our cumulative cardiovascular score that we calculated and sexual minority women had significantly lower scores indicating worse cardiovascular health compared to heterosexual women. Next slide. In our linear regression models, as you can see across all models, sexual minority women had significantly lower cumulative cardiovascular health scores. And this, although it was attenuated, remained significant even when we controlled for pasture discrimination, lifetime sexual abuse, and a number of other known risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Next slide. But this study is actually one of the first studies to assess life simple seven in sexual minority adults. We found that sexual minority women had worse cardiovascular health. This was primarily attributed to tobacco use and elevated BMI, but these differences were not explained by adverse life experiences. Obviously, additional minority stressors, things like internalized homophobia or expectations of rejection, we didn't have access to, so we don't know if maybe that explains the difference between sexual minority and heterosexual women. But the study is important because it adds to growing evidence that we need tailored interventions to promote the cardiovascular health of sexual minority women. Ones that don't just focus necessarily on one cardiovascular risk behavior, but on a number of them. Next slide. And those two studies and my dissertation research were really fundamental in my thinking around the career development award that I submitted and that was later funded by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, which we started in July of 2019. And that study is looking at the associations of sexual identity, life experiences, and CVD risk in sisters. Next slide. And the study has several innovative components. First of all, we're using a sibling design to account for familial factors like genetics and parental factors like parental SES or education that are associated with cardiovascular disease. We're using a life course approach to study cardiovascular health in sexual minority women. And we're assessing the feasibility of remote biomarker collection in this group of people. Next slide. The specific aims of my career development award are to examine whether the associations between sexual identity and physiological risk factors for CBD in women are influenced by interpersonal trauma in childhood and lifetime, perceived discrimination, and resilience factors like coping self-efficacy and parental attachment. Next slide. We are conducting a cross-sectional ancillary study of Dr. Hughes's CHALU study. We're intending to recruit sexual minority women that are enrolled in CHALU and their heterosexual sisters for a total of 65 pairs of sisters. Data collection consists of structured interviews administered by a research assistant, either via telephone or video conference, and biomarker collection, which includes dried blood spots and waist, -to -hip, and, waist and hip circumference measurements. Next slide. So for a biomarker collection, we're using dried blood spots to assess metabolic and inflammatory markers of CBD risk, which are listed here. Well, essentially what we're doing is participants are mailed a dried, spot, dried blood spot collection kit and on a, ahead of a scheduled appointment that they have with the research assistant. The kit includes all the materials they need to collect, to collect the blood spot and also written instructions. The, um, the research assistant then provides them with guidance and instructions while they're actually collecting the blood spot, either via telephone or via video conference. And what we ask them to do is to prick their finger and provide us with three to five drops of blood. And they themselves then mail it to a lab, a dried blood spot lab, which then processes, stores, and then will analyze the, so the blood spots later. And thus far, we've had really good, high quality blood spots, so participants haven't had many issues actually obtaining blood and doing it as on their own, um, just with minimal guidance from the research assistant. Next slide. So we've recruited 15 pairs since January 2020, and actually by the end of the month, I think we'll have 20 pairs completed. But we actually, because of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to suspend our data collection for about two months. And part of it was we were not sure if it was safe to mail people these dried blood spot kits because we weren't really sure how COVID was really spread at the time. So what we did is, although previously what we intended was the participants would complete their interview and dried blood spot collection at the same visit, what we've now done is created a three-month lag between the interview and the dried blood spot. 
And we've had no issues thus far getting participants to come back and do those assessments. And then the other thing is a consideration of family relationships. Family relationships are complicated. Some of the women in the Chulu study either are estranged from their families, so they don't speak to their heterosexual sisters or um, families of origin. Some of them have had sisters who have died. And then we also dealt with the issue that many women who had young children, especially during the pandemic, really could not commit to participating in a research study that would take an hour to an hour and a half. Next slide. So we have 30 participants, 15 pairs thus far. And I think what's happening is exactly what we expected. We see very few differences across age, race, ethnicity, and some other key demographics. But sexual minority women, as is sort of customary across a number of samples, are more likely to report higher educational attainment, even compared to their heterosexual sisters. Next slide. So the next steps in terms, for me, really is to think about Develop, developing an R01 proposal with my K01 data, which will examine these associations longitudinally in a sample of heterosexual and sexual minority cis sibling pairs, and potentially thinking about adding male sibling pairs so that we can examine some sex differences in both cardiovascular health, but also life experiences. One of the key components of my K award is thinking about intervention development. And particularly, one of the things that I would like to do is think about designing tailored interventions for LGBTQ individuals, specifically sexual minority women, that would target and reduce cardiovascular risk factors. And then the last thing, as a person of color doing research in this area, I feel really strongly about the importance of understanding race and variations across different racial groups. And a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last two years has been looking at race and ethnicity, but really thinking about how do we move that forward to look at biological outcomes, which is most of my work focused is, is focused on. Next slide. And then the last thing I want to talk about is I'm very involved in the American Heart Association. Last year, I had the opportunity to serve as the writing chair of the American Heart Association's first scientific statement on the cardiovascular health of SGM adults. And it's actually going to be released sometime in the next month or so. But I had the opportunity to work with really great SGM and cardiovascular scientists. Carl Street at Boston University is the vice chair of the writing group. And then we worked with Tony Apotit, Phoenix Matthews, Heather Corliss, and a number of other really great researchers doing good research in this area. And essentially what the statement does is we provide an overview of current evidence on cardiovascular health in SGM adults. We provide recommendations for clinical, sorry, for research and clinical practice. And we actually developed a conceptual model for understanding cardiovascular health in SGM adults, which we hope will influence the field moving forward. Next slide. And last, I just want to thank Tonda Hughes and Walter Bochting for encouraging me and supporting me in applying for this award. I had a special shout out to Cody Oxaled, one of the PhD students at Columbia, who was the first person to encourage me to think about applying for this. I want to thank my KO1 mentors who are at Columbia and at Emory University for all the support they've given me. And then all the wonderful research assistants and research assistants and graduate students that I've had the pleasure to work with at Columbia, who really teach me a lot by learning about the work that they're doing and have really contributed to publications, data collection across a number of the studies that I've worked on. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. And I think, as Kate said, um, clearly there was evidence in your application that uh, you really are a rising star. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd also just like to point out one thing, you know, one of the concerns of our office really is about training. So we're really interested in thinking about how can we support more institutional training awards. And I think that the fact that you were a part of a T32 at Columbia is really evident in terms of the mentorship that you've been able um, to, to be given and, and how that's really impacted your career. So you're really a great example for why we need more of that. Uh, we do have a question about your study that's come in from a student. And they would like to know um, why you chose to use body mass index in the study uh, when we know that it's been heavily criticized for not being an accurate measure of individual health. Uh, I think a lot of this in sort of like the measures that you choose, obviously we could have picked different measures. There's other anthropomorph anthropometric measures that we could choose, but these validated criteria like the Framingham risk score and other um, screening tools, a lot of them still 
use BMI. And that is something that if I didn't, I think a lot of the time I have to think about if I don't use BMI, then am I somehow not using now a validated or reliable tool to assess the things that I am assessing. So in the work that we're doing actually in my K award, we're not assessing um, body mass index. We're using waist to hip ratio because it's been found to be more predictive of cardiovascular disease and less um, susceptible to some of the um, some of the gender differences that we see across populations, for instance. Great. Well, thank you for that. And then just one other um, question that has come in is about um, the trauma piece in your in your work. And um, did you I, I might have also missed it, but did you define um, interpersonal trauma and sort of what's all included under uh, that umbrella? Yeah, so I don't think I defined it, but it generally across the studies that that I have done, we include things like physical and sexual abuse. And then in childhood, we look at parental neglect as a form of interpersonal trauma. Um, and that's just to clarify, I think from the clinical perspective, trauma means a very different thing to nurses and physicians. So we sometimes have to just be very specific what we mean by trauma, that it's not physical, like a, a car accident or some other physical sort of trauma. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for that really amazing talk and very happy to see research happening um, that's being funded by the National um, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So, so thank you for being here and congratulations on your award. Thank you. Bye. Uh, and so now I would like to introduce um, the um, second ESI awardee. So Dr. Jason Flatt um, is the second person to win this award this year. Dr. Flatt is an assistant professor within the social and behavioral program at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Public Health. Uh, Jason will be presenting a talk regarding identifying risk and protective factors for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia among sexual and gender minority older adults. And I would also just like to say that Jason does some really amazing work um, with the intersex population, which is really critical because we know that that is a population where um, there, there is much work to be done in terms of how much research we're funding. So, so thank you, Jason, for being here, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Parker. I'm excited to be here um, and tell you a little bit about my career ward uh, research. Uh, next slide. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide as well. So I wanted to highlight some of the unique needs that we're seeing for our um, U.S. populations. And much like we're seeing with the demographic shift, shift across the U.S. and other uh, developing nations, we're seeing a greater number of older adults, especially uh, sexual and gender minority older adults. And right now, currently, we estimate that it's around 2.7 million people that are age 50 and older. Uh, we expect that this is going to dramatically increase in the next 20 years, where we could see this uh, more than double. Currently, when we think about those who are being affected by dementia, uh, estimates are pretty crude still, but we're estimating that at least 350,000 people who identify as SGM are currently living with Alzheimer's disease. It's important to uh, acknowledge that this community is at risk and underserved. So specifically, we know that SGM people, as well as subgroups of the community, disproportionately are affected by health, um, health problems. So we see, for instance, higher rates of depression, uh, alcohol and tobacco use. We see lower rates of participation in preventative screenings, likely due to discrimination when accessing health care. We also see that this community is disproportionately affected by cardiovascular disease, as well as HIV and AIDS. Next slide. So there are also some unique concerns for older SGM adults that make it a unique uh, community that deserves greater attention. So we know historically that LGBTQ people did not have equal rights in terms of marriage equality, as well as it wasn't until recently for transgender people that we no longer diagnosed it as a mental health disorder. 
We also know that LGBTQ older people are more likely to experience uh, living alone. So nearly 34% of them live alone currently. We also know that they experience lower rates of access to care. So about a third of them do either do not have uh, financial support to access care or they're afraid to access care because of past experiences with trauma, stigma, discrimination. Um, also, we know that uh, they may not have the same access to support networks. This is especially important for older adults as they encounter more aging health concerns. They may need to rely on caregivers, friends, chosen family members to assist them. And so currently we know that more than 40% uh, of SGM older adults have reported that their support networks are shrinking. We also have know about uh, the challenges for intersectional identities. So specifically thinking about black SGM people as well as transgender communities who may even have greater challenges than when we look at SGM people altogether. We also know that financially there are burdens to this community. In fact, more than 50% of SGM people report being very concerned about not having enough money to live on. And so this is especially a concern if we think about those who may be living with dementia, given that this is one of the most expensive diseases in the nation. Next slide. So today I wanted to cover a little bit of the current evidence that's out there around dementia risk for SGM people. Then I'll go into a bit more about what I'm doing with my National Institute on Aging Career Award. And then I'll talk to you a bit more about some current directions. So next slide. First, I wanted to highlight some research that I've been doing with a team of other researchers looking at subjective cognitive decline among SGM older people. So subjective cognitive decline, what I'm talking about is self-reported experiences or, or um, of confusion or memory loss that may be happening more often or getting worse. So we use data from four years of the U.S. Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance System. This comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we looked at 25 states who had completed this optional module. So currently asking questions about sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as about the subjective cognitive decline is optional in the CDC's BRFIS um, survey that they conduct annually. So what we're seeing for this community uh, who reported it is the higher uh, self-reported rates of this subjective cognitive decline. So 16% of SGM people compared to 11% of non-SGM people. Next slide. We did some subgroup analyses to look at sort of what do the concerns look like by um, SGM identities. What stood out in this is we're seeing higher rates of subjective cognitive decline reported by lesbian cisgender females, so nearly 17%. We're also seeing over 17% among bisexual cisgender individuals. We see for people who identify their sexual orientation as another identity, but were cisgender, it was 16.5%. And then finally, for transgender individuals, this includes individuals of all sexual orientations. We saw that 17% seven, uh, were reporting subjective cognitive decline. And so when you look at this by differences by sexual orientation and gender identity, you can see that there were much higher rates among subgroups of this community. And this may be an area that we should be considering in our future research. Next slide. So the next study I wanted to highlight, and this is one I feel like the field has not given a lot of attention, and there's quite a unique value to this data, comes from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Back in 2015, they looked at Medicare beneficiary files, nearly uh, 32 million people. 
and they looked at people who were entitled for these benefits based on their age. So among people that were age 65 and older. And they did, unfortunately, they did not have information on gender identity, so they did use ICD-9 codes to identify transgender people. But what they found was uh, looking at actual diagnoses in the medical record, 18% of transgender people had a diagnosis of dementia compared to only 12% of their cisgender counterparts. So here it's sort of showing us this signal of some potential concerns uh, with risk of dementia among trans older people. Next slide. Another study that I wanted to highlight that provides some evidence of what's currently happening was a study that I was fortunate to collaborate with uh, Dr. Jaime Perales Puchalt, who used the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center data. This came from 2017, and uh, Dr. Puchalt looked at same sex partners who had been uh, utilizing services through these uh, Alzheimer's disease research centers. What they found based on the clinical assessments, they found overall for dementia about 8% of same-sex couples, uh, the partners of that had dementia compared to 6% of op opposite sex coupled individuals. Uh, what was also unique in this was that they found that sexual minority women who were in these same-sex couples had a higher risk for mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So quite concerning when we're seeing this among uh, sexual minority women. It is important, though, to account for the fact that um, there were site differences, and when they accounted for that, the statistical differences were no longer uh, significant. Uh, they also did find that same-sex couples, when looking at some of these issues, um, were more likely to live alone or not with their uh, partner any longer. And the other issues with this data, it's important to uh, talk about is this may not be generalizable. There's a lot of recruitment bias, uh, the samples, a non-probability sample, and then there could be some other issues of bias in reporting and ascertainment. Next slide. So I wanted to move into talking more to you about what I'm currently doing as part of my K award from the National Institute on Aging. So I'm currently accessing data from the research program for genes, environments, and health. And this is a really unique cohort. It comes from Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. And back in 2007, what they actually had a survey go out to a random sample of their members, and they assessed sexual orientation. They also received permission to link the survey information, a baseline survey, with medical record data that was provided to any of the Kaiser sites in Northern California. So we actually have data for medical records from 1996 up to 2015. Potentially, we're going to be able to look up through 2018. What's unique about this study is the sample size for sexual minorities. So we found over 4,300 people who were age 60 plus identified as a sexual minority. So about a quarter identified as lesbian, uh, over a third were gay men, and then over a third identified as bisexual. One of the limitations of this data, unfortunately, is that we're not able to explore uh, gender identity, so they did not ask about that. Um, and then we were able to pull the dementia diagnoses from the medical record. So I'm only looking at diagnoses that started when they entered the survey. Next slide. So here's a little overview of the cohort. Some interesting pieces I want to point out to you are first, uh, sexual minorities uh, were on average about two years younger than their heterosexual counterparts. We did find among the sexual minority group that less of them identified as female. 
We also see some diversity in terms of race ethnicity, such that uh, more of the sexual, sexual minorities identified as Asian, but we did see uh, less of them identifying as uh, La Latino, Latino. Um, looking at education, this also stands out to us because education is, higher education is a protective factor for dementia. And what we found is that more of the sexual minorities had a college degree or higher. But we also found similar to other research that sexual minorities were much more likely to report never being married and living alone. Next slide. So some of our current uh, estimates, what we're looking at here is just the crude prevalence of dementia. So currently what we're seeing is not a higher rate of dementia among sexual minorities, about 7% compared to 9% for their heterosexual counterparts. Uh, we're currently doing some modeling to look at the longitudinal trends. What we found so far looking at differences by age is that sexual minorities are diagnosed with dementia about one year earlier compared to their heterosexual counterparts. And so this definitely deserves further attention. We also um, found uh, no differences we explored uh, by gender and there were no differences in terms of gender, uh, self-reported gender and dementia diagnoses. So they fell around 7% for sexual minority women and men compared to around 85 to 9% for non-sexual minority uh, men and women. Next slide. So some of the work that we're starting to do is really to better understand risk and protective factors. So one of the first steps we're looking at is the role of age in risk for dementia. As I had mentioned, we're seeing, you know, a younger age of diagnosis, but age is one of the main risk factors for dementia. And so we're modeling currently in that to better understand sort of the trends and what are happening in dementia risk for sexual minorities. We're also going to be looking at the protective effects of education. I had already mentioned we see a higher uh, level of education for sexual minorities, and we want to understand when we model this, how is it acting as a protective factor? The next piece we're really interested in is looking at depression. Depression is a major risk factor for dementia. We often in other population studies find higher rates of depression among sexual and gender minorities. And for our study, we found about 28% of sexual minorities were diagnosed with depression compared to 21% of their heterosexual counterparts. This is also a concern because dement people with depression have a two and a half fold increase in risk for dementia. Then finally, what we're going to be exploring is the role of HIV AIDS in risk for dementia. So we currently have about 4% of sexual minorities who had a diagnosis of HIV in the medical record compared to less than 1% for uh, their heterosexual counterparts. So we'll be taking this into uh, the role. We'll also be looking at aspects around intersectionality and wanting to understand how does race ethnicity play a role in people's risk for dementia, especially if you identify as a sexual minority and of a uh, racial ethnic minority background. Next slide. So I wanted to highlight some future directions and where I hope to take this work. We're currently, you know, what's exciting is we have a large number of participants who reported their sexual orientation back in 2007. And so we're currently modeling, as I had said, some of these risk and protective factors. We're also in this stage, we did also have to pause our activities, but we're currently collecting cognitive function from sexual and gender minority adults. So our hope is to be able to look at potential correlates that may be associated with cognitive impairment. Uh, and the future would be to go after an R01 where we explore this longitudinally.
And then also there's a, a major goal of mine of trying to identify data sets where we could access gender minorities or potentially develop that. Next slide. So the conclusions I'd like to highlight today is what we're currently finding in the literature and in some of my own studies are some similar or higher risks for Alzheimer's disease as well as cognitive impairment um, among SGM populations. We're seeing higher rates of subjective cognitive decline for certain subgroups and this deserves greater attention. Some of the recommendations that I would have for what we're finding is that we really need to encourage encourage the SGM community to participate in early detection. And this is especially important for people that may be experiencing subjective cognitive decline, right? We need to also rule out what are potential causes of this. Subjective cognitive decline, for instance, can be due to depression. It could be due to medications, lack of sleep, as well as other uh, environmental stressors. So more research on that is needed. One of the reasons we haven't moved this field as forward as we um, really where it should be is because we do not have sexual orientation and gender identity data. And we especially need this in aging studies. What's as exciting is I'm starting to see more of this come out in the literature. For instance, I know the health and retirement study has started to collect that. There's been some research actually finding higher rates of cognitive impairment among sexual minorities. We also need to be thinking about interventions that are tailored but also built by our community. So some new uh, studies that are out there that are being led are, for instance, uh, Dr. Fredrickson Goldson's uh, Aging with Pride Idea Study, and as well, I'm collaborating with some colleagues that were adapting the savvy caregiver intervention for SGM people. We also need advocacy. This is really what can change the needs for our SGM elders, is really around advocating to make sure that they are, have access to inclusive services, that there's training, that we can support caregivers, but we also need to broaden how we work with caregivers. We need to think about families of choice and involving them in the care. I also want to highlight something that's coming in June that I think everyone will be really interested in. I'm actually working with the Alzheimer's Association and they're going to be a, doing a conference next June focused on disparities in dementia. This is being led by Dr. Carl Hill and other experts in the field. But what's really exciting is we're going to have an entire day dedicated to LGBTQ health and related to dementia risk. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Next slide. I just want to list some acknowledgments. I would not be here today without a village of people that have supported me across this process. So I want to uh, definitely uh, give a shout out to my program officer, Dr. Melissa Gerald, as well as I'm going to share with you um, some others. Next slide. Uh, hit the next. All right, so I just want to give a shout out to all these individuals, Dr. C, uh, Dr. Paula Fru, Dr. Karen Fredrickson Goldson, Dr. Whitmer, Dr. Steve Gregorich, Dr. Paula Gilson, Dr. Maria Gleemore, Dr. Jalene Johnson, Dr. Karen Scoltetti, Dr. Jaime Perales Pachalt, Dr. Nicholas Lambro, Dr. Ethan Cicero. Amy Rosenwall Mack, Dr. Whitney Wharton, and Dr. Joel Anderson. This is my support network who has been supporting me through this research, and none of this would be possible without them. And that's it. I'm ready for questions. Wow, thank you so much for that lovely presentation. Um, and I really appreciate you pointing out that it really does take a village, right? And that you have so many mentors and colleagues who've been supportive of this work. That's so great to see. 
Um, so I have a couple of things that I would like to know about. Um, first, I just want to sort of highlight the importance of this population. So in so many ways, this is one of the populations that we know we need much more research on, right? And because the population is aging, this is really critically important. So thank you so much for doing this work. Um, we do have a question about relationships related to this work in terms of um, relationships being a mediating factor um, and also just thinking about things like isolation and dementia. And I wonder if you have anything that you'd like to say um, about that. And then, of course, um, if you do have a link for that June conference, people are interested in, in us being able to share that uh, with the attendees. Absolutely. I will totally get that to you, Dr. Parker. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important issue that we need to be thinking about around relationships. We know that there are greater risks, right? I told you we see, uh, even among most of these cohorts, higher rates of living alone among SGM older people, right? So that's definitely a piece. We also see, because of that, right, higher rates of being single. There also, we have to remember the historical issues that have influenced the health of our SGM older people, right? Discrimination, the McCarthy era, where people were afraid and losing their jobs in the federal government, right? We know about the Stonewall riots, where Black trans women fought, you know, for the rights of our community, right? But we... This community has, many of them have been marginalized, had to live their life hiding their identity and potentially, you know, be isolated from their family. So they can't, re, you know, they can't rely on the same social support structures or the relationship networks that, you know, we might think traditionally people could access when they're getting older. And so that makes it much harder for them, one, to cope with dementia if they get it, but also potentially to know if they're having problems. In most of our dementia research, we rely on an informant to tell us about what's going on. Mm -hmm. They may not have an informant. So these make it really challenging for this community and why we need this type of work. Yeah, so one um, one final question. Actually, here's another question. Um, so, but uh, someone has a question about ethical considerations and wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the ethical considerations involved in researching older uh, aged SGM populations um, and, mm -hmm. you know, not just related to IRB, but also sort of after IRB. Um, mm -hmm. I suspect just thinking about general um, uh, yeah. generally in that population, some of those considerations, the older older adults? Well, there, there's definitely some fears for this community. So one of the first ones that comes to mind, right, is if you received a dementia diagnosis from a medical doctor, you potentially, uh, they often have to report this to um, the driver's license bureau, and you may have your driver's license taken away. Imagine if you have to rely on your car, maybe you don't live in an urban environment or you don't have access to public transportation. How are you going to get around? How are you, how are you going to get your basic needs met? So that can affect people's reluctance to even want to go see someone if they're experiencing maybe some memory challenges. Right. So that's a huge issue. Um, ethical issues, right, around doing research is how do we best support SGM older people who might have cognitive impairment and dementia? First, what do we do when we're sharing a potential diagnosis, right? Who do we need to involve in that process? That's why I emphasize the piece around families of choice, thinking of friends, neighbors, right? So that's going to be a key issue. Um, but we also have an obligation to, and it's a big piece of what I do, of working with community-based organizations, but we really need to make sure that we can bolster SGM people living with dementia support networks. And so just telling they, them they have a diagnosis and leaving is not acceptable. And so we need to do more to connect them to services and support. So those are some of the, the unique challenges I would see in some of our work around ethics. 
Great. All right, well, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. This has been so delightful um, to celebrate uh, the early stage investigators. This is one of the, I think, most important things that we do in our office is to really lift up uh, people who are doing this work um, and hopefully provide a forum so that we can say, you know, NIH really cares about this work and we, we really care about making sure that the community of researchers is supported. So yes. thank you to you and Billy. Yes, I'm so grateful full for this opportunity. Thank you all. Yeah, and congratulations again. Um, and so now it is my sincere pleasure uh, to introduce our distinguished investigator um, awardee. So Dr. Ronald Stahl um, is uh, being awarded for his outstanding contributions to the field of SGM health um, over a very illustrative career. Dr. Stahl is professor and associate chair for science for the Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh in the School of Public Health. Today, he's gonna to be presenting a talk about continuing to move the field of LGBT health research forward. On a personal note, I just wanna say uh, that Ron was one of the very first people who reached out to me when I um, first came to the office of the director in this role. And I have to say, it meant so much to me to have somebody who was so distinguished reach out and be supportive. And my experience over the past five years has been that the community in general has been incredibly supportive. And so thank you, Ron, for being someone who really modeled that. Um, I really appreciate it. And of course, we appreciate all of the work that you do in the field. And so I look forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Um, can we start the slides? Um, yeah, um, the first thing I have to say is that I was very surprised by the receipt of this award and I found it very moving. I'd like to thank the Office of Sexual and Gender Minority Health uh, for according me this award. I, it's um, very special. Um, next slide. Uh, the invitation letter uh, asks I prepare a uh, presentation highlighting my sexual and gender minority related research. This was a little perplexing to me because um, I'm sure there are people who've been able to move a field forward on their own by themselves, but that is spectacularly not the case with me. Next slide. So I want to take uh, a, a few minutes to highlight um, some of the people with whom I've had the honor of working. Um, first at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. Um, everyone deserves a shout out. I'll just mention a few people here. Uh, the first are three very courageous and brilliant men who were infected with HIV early in the epidemic and um, assumed, um, I'm sorry to say correctly, that they would die of AIDS. Despite the fact having been given a death sentence of, of a scary disease like that, they used the remaining years and days of their life to move the field of HIV prevention forward. As long as I live, I will never forget the heroism evidenced by Leon McCusick, Bob Hayes, and Chuck Frucci. Next slide. Um, I also had many amazing collaborators at the CDC, some of whose work I'll, I'll highlight later. I want to give a special shout out to Ron Valdeseri and Rich Walensky, um, with whom I had the pleasure of editing a book on, on health disparities among um, American gay men. Next slide. Um, th there are going to be two uh, sides of names here at the University of Pittsburgh, but I would be remiss without particularly highlighting the work of Tony Sylvester and Nina Markovic, who set up a study group in sexual and gender minority health at the University of Pittsburgh that provided the basis for our certificate program, which was the first certificate program in LGBT health research in the world, and um, and was the basis on which we we founded and built the Center for LGBT Health Research at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, their work was amazing. Um, we also I also want to give a shout out to Chris Byer, Jose Byermeister, uh, Brian Dodge, and next slide Tonya Petit uh, for our work in um, collaboratively editing a book in research methods among sexual and gender minority health. Next slide. Um, if there are any lessons learned from all this, um, it's that multidisciplinary teams are necessary to advance the field, 
but they need not just to come from multiple academic disciplines, but community-based organizations and at-risk communities themselves to ensure that the goals that were that were um, that, that our research questions are, are speaking to the lived experiences of these communities, and that establishing centers of excellence in LGBT health research will advance the field in unpredicted and ground unpredictable and groundbreaking ways. There are already multiple models to do this. Um, one of the most obvious is Fenway Health in Boston that started out as a community-based organization and has grown to become an academic and research powerhouse. Uh, there's also the, the model at the University of Pittsburgh that used university-based funding um, to start our Center for LGBT Health Research, and that, that support was much appreciated. Next slide. Um, I want to turn now to the theme that has been most important in my own career, which is looking at health disparities among LGBT populations. And it's important to remember that when the AIDS epidemic began, which is where so much of our data now comes from, the um, initial assumptions were based on work that had been done, you know, even in the 50s. Um, and, and, and that we really had very little data to, to turn to beyond these classic studies. Um, one of these was Evelyn Hooker's work that looked at standardized tests and social function between gay and straight men in, in LA, and she found no difference. And this was taken by the larger field to mean that there were very few, if any, health, uh, psychosocial health disparities among LGBT populations. However, when we got the um, working on the AIDS epidemic and starting on databases to think about how to move the prevention field forward, next slide, um, we, we were aware of many, many different studies, um, mostly based on bar samples, for the most part bar samples, that, that showed very significant disparities when looked at similar prevalence rates among, among straight men. Um, and so when Joe Catania took the lead on moving the urban men's health study forward, which was the first population household-based sample of gay men in the United States in, in America's largest gay ghettos, we, we took care to include very um, standard measures of psychosocial health um, problems with the idea of being able to show that the bar-based literature was incorrect and it had exaggerated these health disparities. Next slide. Unfortunately, we found the opposite of what we had hoped to find. Um, the Urban Men's Health Study found very high rates of depression, attempted suicide, childhood sexual abuse. Next slide. Um, as everyone knows, HIV infection, substance use and abuse, partner violence, other investigators associated with their teams, um, Greg Greenwood, for example, used a, um, re, uh, a re administration of a survey to the men in the urban society showed very high rates of, of arguably the most dangerous drug addiction of all, and that is tobacco use, and certainly a disparity with heterosexual men. Next slide. But all of these disturbing health disparities were dwarfed compared to the disparity that we saw with black gay men and HIV. Um, this is what we knew about a decade ago. And as the, then, as is still the case, the vast majority of gay men with HIV are, are gay men um, and are people living with HIV are gay men. And even in this over-representation, the vast majority of these cases are among black gay men. So about a quarter of the AIDS caseload in the United States is found among black gay men. Um, and even more disturbing, a, a, a very large number of these cases are found among young black men. Next slide. Um, but there was a puzzle in the literature um, that while there was no question that HIV prevalence and incidence was very high among black gay men, risk-taking behaviors were lower, um, and if anything, um, far lower than those shown among white gay men, which meant that our so-called risk behaviors for HIV transmission among MSM could not be used to explain why black gay men had such high rates of HIV infection. And if we do not understand what's, what the risks are for HIV infection, we cannot prevent the epidemic. Next slide. This was the puzzle that a brilliant scientist at the Centers for Disease Control, um, Greg Millett, um, uh, tried to answer. He started with a systematic literature review, and Greg um, pointed out that the sexual networks among black gay men are very dense. Um, the big predictors of, of, of with whom Americans have sex are race and age. It follows that the, the, the sexual networks among black gay men are, are quite tightly interconnected. 
Um, also, Greg was able to show that there are very high rates of unknown and untreated HIV positive in these very tight sexual networks. So that when a, um, a new uh, HIV negative man enters these tight sexual networks, um, where the, which are characterized by very high community loads and, and very high rates of men who are highly viremic and therefore efficient transmitters of HIV, you end up with a high transmission risk of HIV um, for black MSM. Next slide. Greg went on to, um, a, a, to a, do a whole series of brilliant meta-analyses to illustrate and, and support his um, model. However, um, we also wanted to look at large database samples to see if these, if these hypotheses could be tested in, in large standalone samples. Um, and so we went back and looked at the very largest samples for MSM at the time. And as you can see, even samples of close to 4,000 men only yielded, only yielded a very small sampling of black MSM, 11 guys. So you couldn't possibly use these data sets uh, to test them all that hypotheses. Next slide. And this is what drove us, um, and, and this yields the final, you know, the unfortunate conclusion, the standard approaches to sampling cannot be used to address the hypotheses that, met, that Greg Millett proposed to explain the HIV epidemic among black MSM. This conundrum is, of course, the case with nearly every study that we do with sexual minorities, that it's, it's very hard to get the large sample size we need to address the the, uh, the needs of the populations that we care to that we want to um, study. Next slide. Um, and that brought us to the Power Study, which was a collaboration between the Center for Black Equity and the Center for LGBT Health at this at Pitt's um, center, uh, at the Pitt School of Public Health. Next slide. Um, in working with the the director of the uh, Center for Black Equ Equity, the amazing Earl Fox. We did some back of the envelope estimates based on existing CDC data sets where we combined data sets to end up with relatively stable estimates of access to prevention technologies among black gay men and to it to and, and with hypotheses that derive from the, the Millet model. And, and what we found was that even uh, to get the expected rate of delayed entry into care among positive black MSM, we need a sample of about 6,000 men. Again, showing that these standard approaches to sampling don't serve our needs in, in describing risk in this population. Next, pop, next slide. Um, and that was the basis of our partnership with Earl Fox and the Center for Black Equity. Um, the um, where we wanted to basically to get these large samples, we wanted to take samples of Black MSM at Black Pride events around the country. The Black Pride social movement began in 1990 at a single event in D.C. I'm, I'm happy to say that some of the advocates um, who started this event are still with us. Um, but that one movement became a national um, pride movement, and now there are Black Pride events in cities around the country um, all summer long. Uh, about a decade ago, the Center for Black Equity has estimated that about 200,000 people attended these Pride events. Their latest estimate was closer to a third of the million. So the Center for Black Equity provides technical support to help uh, pull off these events um, with, um, with a great deal of success. Next slide. Um, as everyone who's been to a Pride event knows, these are um, chaotic celebrations, uh, very joyful, but not the kind of thing where you can give out tickets and, and sample every 10th person. So we, we use time location sampling um, in five of the largest Prides, Philadelphia, Houston, Detroit, DC, and Atlanta. And our first order of randomization was to sample events sponsored by Black Pride in those cities. And the second order of randomization were the time slots in which men would attend those sponsored events. Next slide. This is how it worked in, in Philly um, one weekend. So these are events sponsored by Black Pride in Philly um, for a particular weekend. Um, and, and next slide, with, with estimates of the number of men who would attend those events. Um, and this is how we ended up doing the sampling. So we sampled the events, and then we also sampled two-hour time slots so that we would only be there during the time slots at which men could attend these events. Next slide. Um, this is how it worked on the ground. So the venue is a bar that serves black gay men. Um, we created lines on the sidewalk approaching the bar um, and, and set up a counter. So if men came into the intercept line, they were counted, uh, which we could later use for waiting purposes. We set up survey areas, and if men entered the area, our recruiters approached the men, 
and ask if they wanted to be part of the survey, and they would do the survey work at, at the survey area next to the sidewalk. Next slide. This is a, an illustration of, of, our, of how we set up outside of a bar outside of Philly. So these are our survey tables and, and the iPads. Next slide. Um, the behavioral survey uh, took about 20 minutes to complete. Um, it was done on tablets. Um, men, they were self-administered and all anonymous. Uh, men who completed the behavioral survey were given $10. Um, the um, organizers of a health fair allowed, get lent us a room graciously and let us do it in a hotel room. Um, another um, a site was next to a gay bar in Atlanta where a local restaurant let us use their one of their tables. Next, next table, next slide. <laughs> um, after men were um, completed the behavioral survey, we um, invited them to do confidential HIV testing by community-based partners. Uh, these partners did the testing, and if men were positive, were able to um, connect them to care immediately in their local setting. Um, men who did the confidential testing got $10, um, and um, the community-based partner got an additional $10. Next slide. If men did not want to do confidential-based testing, they could do anonymous HIV testing where they did not get their test results. Um, we did it with Oracle. Quick and men who uh, did the testing got at $10. So men got $20 for participating in the survey and the study. Next slide. Uh, the beauty of this approach to sampling in, in these kind of community events is how flexible it is. We could do it outside of bars, in a park, um, in a parking lot, in a giant um, shopping center, and under a magnolia tree in Atlanta. Keep going. Next slide. Um, this is what we look like at the beginning of our survey work. Next slide. And this is what we look like at the end. This is exhausting work. And yes, my 60-something-year-old carcass was out in front of hip-hop clubs until 2 in the morning, and it was an amazing experience. Next slide. Um, we were able to get uh, more than uh, 5,000 men um, who completed the behavioral survey, and as you can see, um, from the, um, the topics here, we were able to really drill down and do some very specific um, um, hypotheses um, derived from the Millet um, model. Um, it, you know, um, uptake uh, prevention technologies, um, treatment as prevention, um, psychosocial health disparities, um, interpersonal violence, even down to the level of unstable housing and HIV risk among black MSM, and, and a set of analyses among transgender African American women. Next slide. Um, um, Lee Bukowski um, uh, looked at, um, took a, made a point of looking at um, risk among black transgender women. Um, and these are analyses that she presented at the Durban Health Conference in, um, at, uh, four years ago at the International AIDS Conference. Um, the, um, the, uh, as you can see from uh, these slides, the, the rates of psychosocial health problems and victim violence, structural violence really among drag, black trans women is through the roof. Um, and a whole, Lee has moved forward with the whole set of papers on this population. Next slide. Regarding HIV infection rates uh, for black MSM and black trans women, the power study yielded an infection rate of 41% among black MSM. This is not an outlier in this literature. Derek Matthews' work um, in his paper, Moving Backwards, um, Running Backwards, um, pointed out that over the life course, black MSM can expect a 50% prevalence rate. The small sample of black trans women that we were able, fortunately, to get had a rate almost as high. Oh, and these are rates for whom we have, people for whom we have biological testing. Um, next slide. These appalling rates of HIV infection, um, it, it needs to be said, are, are, are really need to be compared to the kind of the global literature. Um, so that the United States has done amazing work through the PREFAR program, something every American should be so proud of, of the work that we've done to stop the HIV epidemic in, in, in developing world countries around the world. Um, this is something that I got to witness during my work at the Centers for Disease Control and something that uh, made, was my proudest day as an American. Um, but it, also needs to be said that if the rates of HIV infection on black MSM in the United States are roughly twice that of, of those in, in developing world countries, we still have more to work to do among citizens of our own country. Next slide. 
These rates lead us to the inevitable conclusion. If black MSM in the United States were able to form a country of their very own, that country would have the highest rate of HIV infection in the entire world. Next slide. So what are we going to do about it? Um, there's some basic public health work we can do that, that, that is continuing to this day. Um, identifying positive men and getting them into care, helping HIV negative men access prevention technologies, and address the multiple health problems that afflict black MSM, in particular the ways that racism and homophobia compromise the health of black MSM. Next slide. But we can also set up training programs for scholars interested in the health of black MSM, um, which is something that we successfully did, I think, at the University of Pittsburgh by combining existing resources. Our program in LGBT health research combined with our PhD and existing PhD and DRPH programs at the University of Pittsburgh and T32 pro, um, funding to support postdoctoral and predoctoral training for scholars interested in the health of black gay men. Um, it's something that um, we learned a lot from and enriched our program. Next slide. Um, stepping back from the situation with Black MSM, I think we can step back and think about the field in general. While it's true that we have a lot of descriptive work, um, particularly for white MSM, um, there's a relative, I think it's fair to say, there's a relative lack of descriptive research for focus on lesbian women, bisexual communities, transgender, and non binary populations. In particular, there's a lack of descriptive research on intersectional gender minority populations, black lesbian women, Hispanic transgender populations, and so on. Um, but going past description, there's a definite or a lack of research on intervention development that will address the disparities that we're um, describing. And the issue of translational research, we can take efficacious interventions and put them in the community and evaluate them to show that they're effective is something I think that's still on the horizon. Next slide. We know from the HIV literature that these interventions, that individual level interventions can result in significant declines in risk-taking behaviors. These are results from a meta-analysis that Jeff Herbst did at the Centers for Disease Control showing impressive declines in the traditionally understood um, risk-taking behaviors by MSM who've in experienced uh, theory-based interventions. Next slide. Robert Coulter of the Pittsburgh Group did a systematic review looking at interventions for sexual and gender minority youth uh, from 2000 to almost 2020 and found only 12 of these. Um, only one of these interventions was scored at the highest level of research um, rigor. That said, these, this cluster of initial interventions is showing that we can field these interventions and that we can expect to see efficacious interventions in the future um, enter the literature. Next slide. It's also important to remember that structural interventions affect health. Um, we've been fortunate to live in an era with historic changes over the past three decades in laws governing the health of se and laws, laws governing sexual minorities. Can we adopt kids? Can we be fired for um, for in, for being gay? Can, can, can landlords throw us out of our apartments for being gay? And the, but one thing that's really important about to notice is that there are varying trajectories of changes in these laws at the state level. Some states have remained at low levels of support um, for the past 30 years, and other states have moved to very high levels of support for full citizenship of, of sexual minority populations. One can regard this as an enormous uncontrolled experiments um, um, parent, uh, and, and, and look at the um, uh, tests of associations between the church trajectory of change in laws and HIV outcomes. Next, outcome, next slide. This is an illustration of what I mean of just some pilot data as we were getting ready to submit a proposal that we submitted in, in, in collaboration with Sam Friedman of NDRI and Hannah Cooper of Emory University. These are just changes in about seven laws governing sexual minorities. Um, in selected states from 2000 to 2011. As you can see, some states stayed at a very low level. So um, Texas, uh, to pick on Texas, stayed at a very low level. Other states went very quickly to the highest level of support and stayed there. Um, that would be Massachusetts. Other states like Iowa gradually went up to the highest level over time. Next slide. So the, um, we pulled together a coding, a legal coding group and coded changes in laws at the state level on these 11 variables affecting sexual and gender minority health. 
Um, these were for a 15 year period. So can we be um, fired for being gay? Can we lose our housing? Can um, hotels and restaurants refuse to um, per, um, accommodate us or, or rent us a hotel room for a same sex couple and so on? Um, and so that these are allow us a measure of how policy climate has changed regarding sexual minorities over a 15 year period. Next slide. Um, we then collaborated, we were allowed to collaborate with the Centers for Disease Control, where they um, co collaborated with us to do an analysis of the entire CDC caseload. So this is anonymous caseload that we were able to look at four variables um, at, the, at, the, at the city level, the, at the MSA level. Um, these variables were new diagnoses, late diagnoses, that means were you diagnosed with AIDS well, on your first HIV test. Um, AIDS diagnoses per 10,000 positive MSM and AIDS mortality per 10,000 MSM. So these were the HIV outcomes from the entire um, caseload and the independent variables were trajectory of change in citizen protection were consistently low support as illustrated by the case of Texas, increasing support, the Iowa's of the world and consistently high support. This analysis was um, led as I think I said, Mark Hotzenbuehler and, and this is the reference for the paper. Next slide. These are the results of the hudson Bueller analyses. I'll just go through the top line, but as you can see, for three of the four um, HIV outcomes, there's actually an impressive effect, but also an impressive dose response effect. So on the first line, HIV diagnoses per 10,000 MSM, there was a 39% decline in states with consistently high policy support and, a, and almost a 20% decrease, an 18% decrease in states with increasing policy support compared to states with consistently low support. You can see the effect sizes for the remaining changes in, in changes in HIV policy support and outcomes in the HIV um, uh, caseload um, over uh, this period in 94 of America's largest uh, cities. Next, next slide. Um, one of the nice things about structural interventions like this is that while we as researchers certainly have no control over these sexual, um, over these structural interventions, and by the way, the hudson Bueller analysis is not randomized, but it is a very strong indicator that perhaps these changes in policy will result in positive outcomes. But you can also think about the outcomes that were not the expected outcome. So let's take go, taking a look back at the depression analyses in the urban men's health study. Um, Tom Mills took an analysis looking at the big predictors of depression among gay men in that data set, and he found four, alienation from the gay community, not identifying as gay, history of anti-gay threats or violence, and lacking of domestic partners. This is what seems to be the big drivers of depression in this, in this data set. Next slide. Uh, so why on earth would changes in policy permitting same-sex marriage decrease rates of depression in MSM? Next slide. This is a case where pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, this is a photograph um, in the, from the a brief window of time in the city of San Francisco when same-sex marriage was, um, was permitted. This, of course, was stopped by a court which ended up going to the Supreme Court for the uh, ruling in marriage equality, which everyone knows about. But for a very brief period of time, San Francisco was the pioneer. Uh, these two women are these wonderful matriarchs who've been working to advance lesbian rights since the 1950s. Then Mayor Kevin, um, Kevin Gase, uh, as mayor, uh, then, then mayor of San Francisco had the class. There's no other word for it to invite these two women to be the first same-sex couple in America to be married. But marriage does more than acknowledge our commitment to each other. Next slide. It protects our families. It, it allows us to provide the structural basis to protect our families. Next slide. It strengthens our commitment to our traditions and our spiritual lives. This is a, 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 a couple getting married in San Francisco City Hall. Next slide. Um, it strengthens our, our, our connection to the community. This is the line of people waiting to get married in San Francisco during that brief window when we could. Next slide. And it, connect, connect, it strengthens our connections to society at large. Next slide. So in our conclusions, I think it's fair to say we've made enormous progress in the study of sexual and gender minority health over the past two decades. But it's also clear we have a great deal more work to do. 
I think about this as a generational challenge, not only the generations of research moving from description to theory building to on which interventions can be based and then finally translational research, but also the generations of scholars that will be required to move this ambitious agenda forward. And our ability to meet this challenge depends on our success in supporting new generations of investigators interested in sexual and gender minority health and especially sex, um, gender health among racial minorities. And it's important in, in moving the field forward that both individual and structural level interventions hold promise for improving the health of sexual and gender minority populations. Next slide. Thank you so much, and thanks again for this great honor. Well, thank you so much for that. That was more than we could have expected, and I think a really lovely indication of why um, we decided that you would be a wonderful recipient for the Distinguished Award this year. Um, so I would just like to say a couple of things. I don't think that you could have done a better job of sort of framing our day for us. So we started off the day with a keynote lecture by Dr. Lisa Boleg, who really spoke about intersectionality. And then we ended our day with this same sort of important uh, concept being brought to the forefront. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we do have actually a question about that. So um, first off, a thanks for your very informative presentation. Um, but there is an attendee who would like a clarification. So when you use the phrase um, uh, black gay men, do you mean uh, gay men specifically or does that also include bisexual men? Um, my apologies for speaking very rapidly um, during a short presentation. It was um, there was a wide range of um, uh, identity of sexual identity, um, and about eighty percent of the men identified as gay or same gender loving. Um, there was a smaller group. I think it was about fifteen or eighteen percent of men who identified as as bisexual. Um, in, in the study, and and the, and the data set, you know, is available to look at differences between these two groups, as as some analyses already have done, um, and I, I think about one percent of the sample actually identified as heterosexual. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, we have another um, question that's come in that wants to know about what future directions do you see in terms of examining marriage equality's impact on closing the health and wealth disparities among black SGM people and other communities of color? Great question. Um, it isn't just marriage equality, although that's very, very important. Um, there are still states where um, sexual and gender minority people can be thrown out of their housing or fired for being gay. This is an ongoing stressor, and it's expect, it, one would expect that it would be most um, stressful among the most marginalized populations with the fewest resources um, to combat these. I'm, I'm reminded of when marriage equality happened in Pennsylvania. Uh, two women near my city of Pittsburgh got married. Uh, one of the women, unfortunately, announced this at work and was fired on the spot. So there are still um, um, lots of basic rights. If you look at the list of 11 rights um, that, that uh, the Hudson Bueller anal um, analysis considered, there are many, many areas where we need to work on structural inequality, mm -hmm. and particularly with racial and ethnic minority populations. Yeah. Um, so as the distinguished awardee, I'd actually like to um, ask you a last question. So I'm wondering if you could just sort of think back on your illustrative career and think about sort of what do you think has made the most impact in terms of SGM health research, either um, at the federal level or um, specific policies or anything that you think was really sort of a, um, a really watershed moment and what, as you look forward, what do you think needs to happen to have more of those so that we can make a broader impact within the community? Wow. Um, well, there's no question that the advocates for um, citizenship rights and for HIV um, uh, um, rights made an enormous difference. And it made it possible for us to have the language and, and, and to actually have, have feel confident to go to places like the NIH and other policy um, um, settings to advocate for populations that you know had had in decades past 
um, been been criminalized. Um, and so that this this is something that's made an enormous um, uh, difference in our work. Uh, the other thing that I think has made an ador a big difference, I'd like to think anyway, is the work that uh, my colleagues did and, and many others um, to actually document the extent of the disparities that are out there and for us to get some handle on which disparities are the most damaging and which disparities really should be accorded the highest priority in doing intervention work. Um, and it would, I really look forward to the day when we have proven interventions that we can give back to the community to address some of these um, health disparities. And, 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 and of course, the structural intervention work that I referred to and, and described from the Hotzenbuehler analysis um, are a very important piece of all of that work. Great. Well, thank you again for being here. I'm so proud of this investigator awards program. And I think that um, after hearing these three presentations, people can understand why. So thank you very much. This was really a wonderful day of presentation um, from the grantees, from the awardees, from our, our colleague in the IRP. Um, so I just want to thank everybody again. This really highlighted, I think, the amazing work that's been happening. Um, sort of across the board and really highlighted some really unique areas of research that I think are just sort of taking off um, with hopefully more support from the NIH. So before we hear our closing remarks, um, I would like to make a very exciting announcement. So today, the SGMRO is thrilled to announce release of the NIH SGM strategic plan to advance the health and well being of SGMs for FY 2021 to 2025. I think most of you probably know that the previous strategic plan was so important in terms of the development of this office and also the way that NIH really prioritized this work across the agency. The plan really uh, came together after more than a year's worth of work. I'd like to commend the staff in the SGMRO for all of the hard work in bringing this together. We got so much input and assistance and um, people were incredibly gracious with their time in developing this plan. So I'd like to thank our research working group, our research coordinating committee, um, a planning subcommittee of that group, NIH leadership, and of course the public who also provided input um, through our request for information process. The strategic plan highlights um, both scientific research opportunities and operational goal areas to develop and expand SGM health research and related initiatives across the agency. The plan has been posted on our website and I encourage everyone to go there um, and check it out. Like I said, we're incredibly excited about it. And I think one of the things that's really sort of gotten us excited to think about the future is the time that we've spent looking past, looking into the past over the previous five years and really understanding that NIH as a whole, I believe has really made an impact. We have so much more work to be done. And I think that the new strategic plan will really motivate us uh, and lay the groundwork as we hope as we look to implement uh, the strategic plan. So um, I would now uh, like to announce uh, Dr. Hannah Valentine, who was meant to be our closing um, speaker, has had an emergency and is unable to join us. Um, Dr. Hannah Valentine is at the end of the month retiring. Um, she is moving back uh, to California to be at Stanford uh, where she was previously, but she has spent the last several years here at NIH supporting diversity efforts as the uh, chief scientific officer for workforce diversity. Uh, she has been a friend to the office and has really helped us think about um, how we can better integrate sexual and gender minority uh, diversity efforts within the scientific um, workforce. So uh, because Hannah cannot be with us this evening, uh, we are gonna have somebody else from the Scientific Workforce Diversity Office. I'm incredibly pleased to announce that Dr. Lyle Tomlinson, who's the communications team lead for SWD will be joining us. Um, Lyle and I have worked closely on some of the work that SWD has led in thinking about what's happening with diversity, equity, and inclusion related to the COVID pandemic. And so this has been really timely and Lyle's support of our work and the support of making sure that we're asking about sexual orientation and gender identity and surveys that we're doing of the workforce has been really key. So I wanna thank um, Lyle for his support and welcome him uh, to provide closing remarks for the day. Uh, thank you, Karen. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. Uh, can you guys all hear me? 
Yes, we can. Great, great. Um, so uh, as Karen mentioned, my name is Lyle Tomlinson. I serve as the communications team leader for the Scientific Workforce Diversity Office. Um, unfortunately, as Karen mentioned, uh, Dr. Valentine, who is our chief officer, can't be here today, but she um, wanted me to send her regrets and also offer some closing remarks on her behalf. Um, so over the course of a few hours, I'm sure you guys got to hear a lot about great science that's coming from a number of different people that are really trying to investigate um, things that fall into very important social milieu that maybe sometimes gets left out of uh, bigger um, announcements with respect to science. Um, I think the work here today demonstrates that true, true science and true um, in, in true scientific diversity really comes from seeing a number of players who come to the table with interest in various um, topics across the spectrum. So one of the things that really drew me to this office was their interest in um, the scientific intellectual capital and the entirety of the scientific intellectual capital. Unfortunately, because Dr. Valentine can't be here, she usually gives this regaling story about her interest in uh, cardiology, but more specifically, heart plant uh, transplantation and the increase in um, African Americans uh, that seem to be rejecting heart transplants at a, at a uh, quite high rate. So that drove her to do a lot of investigation into a field that a lot of people weren't interested in. And so because of her drive, she was able to find some genetic markers that did relate to African-Americans rejecting transplants. Um, but also um, that investigation helped bridge the field and move the field forward as a whole. And so the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I think that's just one key example of how an interest that really reflects social issues and social pressures can honestly be uh, uh, positive for the scientific workforce as a whole. And one of the reasons why you know we're we're so interested in in forwarding all these things is because we truly truly believe this. And so, in line with that, there are a number of different programs that. Dr. Valentine, and also a number of other offices within the NIH have worked to forward so that we can increase the diversity within the scientific workforce. So one of those is the Distinguished Scholars Program, which is an intramural program in which we cluster hire a cohort of individuals who have a commitment to diversity and inclusion for the tenure track. Um, I will skip over many of the details, but generally it has been very promising for our institution. And now 13% of our tenure track investigators are from underrepresented groups. But we are still continuing to try to shift the culture um, here, but also um, elsewhere. So we are now putting out uh, an extramural version of the program because that was so successful called FIRST. And so we're looking to have extramural institutions also do the same, cluster hiring diverse group of qualified scientists to put forth their research, but also to change the culture at the institutions in which they live. One of the other things that we're really proud of is the NIH Equity Committee. Um, and basically it is um, an initiative or a committee that helps us to track the metrics for demographics, salaries, diversity in speaker series to make sure that there is faculty equity um, because what gets measured gets done. Um, lastly, one of our other programs that we're really proud of is the National Research Mentoring Network, uh, which is a great research uh, resource for uh, researchers from biomedicine to social sciences um, that provides them with evidence-based mentorship and professional development that addresses the benefits of diversity, inclusion, and culture. So with that, I will close. Uh, it has been uh, great talking to you. Um, I hope that you will take all that you've seen here today as evidence that contrary to the usual saying, great minds think alike, all the information that you've seen today proves that great minds think differently. So with that, I'll turn the floor back over to Karen, uh, who will probably leave you with some final words for the session. Yep, thank you so much, Lyle. We really appreciate you standing in for Hannah. Um, and with that, I'd just like to close our meeting, say thank you again to all of our presenters. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated for the day. Um, and just a reminder that our strategic plan has been posted and I hope everybody goes to see where we're headed for the next five years. So thanks and have a great day.